I've been on council for 15 years and over the last six years or so, we've seen a, uh, a reduction of funding of about $500,000 a year and an increase in download costs of about the same number, 500,000 for a net loss of a million dollars a year in operating funding to our municipality. So for us, that's, we only have a $5 million budget. So to lose 20% of your capability is, is almost devastating at times. Welcome to a special edition of the Cross Border Interviews. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am your host for this special episode. Today, we will be focusing on the issues facing rural municipalities in Alberta. While much attention has been given to urban centers in this province over the last few weeks, it is important to recognize the unique challenges that rural communities face. And today, we have the opportunity to hear from individuals who are on the front lines of these rural municipalities. Our guests today include Corina Williams, who is the Reeve of Northern Sunrise County, Bob Willing, who is the Reeve of the Municipal District of Peace, and Terry Ungarian, who is the Reeve of the County of Northern Lights. We will be discussing some of the most pressing issues that are affecting rural municipalities in northern Alberta. One of the topics of discussion in a roundtable is the local impact of federal and provincial jurisdiction regulations. We will also explore how changes in the resource industry has affected rural economies and what measures have been taken to mitigate some of these impacts. We will also discuss the challenges that some municipalities are facing when dealing with federal and provincial representation. There will be lots to discuss today in this episode, so sit back and enjoy. Let's get started. I want to thank uh, Reeve Williams, uh, Reeve Willing, and Reeve Ungarian for sitting down and doing this. Uh, I want to start with this question. As we are talking about northern rural municipalities, I want to know individually from each and every single one of you, starting with uh, Rob, uh, Bob, sorry, uh, the uh, Reeve for MD of Peace. What do you believe is the most pressing systematic issues that are facing northern rural municipalities today? Well, for, for us, especially with our municipality, we're a very small municipality, uh, both in, in population and area wise. Uh, funding is probably the biggest issue that we are facing right now. Um, we've had uh, some severe cutbacks in government funding and uh, at the same time uh, a, a number of things that have been offloaded onto the municipality. Um, we only have one option of raising money and that's through taxation and we rely on both the federal and provincial governments to, to make up the difference for our operators. So uh, I've been on council for 15 years and over the last six years or so, we've seen a, uh, uh, a reduction of funding of about $500,000 a year and an increase in download costs of about the same number, 500,000 for a net loss of a million dollars a year in operating funding to our municipality. So for us, that's, we only have a $5 million budget. So to lose 20% of your capability is, is almost devastating at times. Perry, would you agree with what Bob just said there, that funding is one of the most pressing systematic issues, or is there another that's facing the County of Northern Lights? Well, absolutely. I uh, agree with what Bob said. I think all rural northern municipalities are facing those challenges with uh, downloading of more and more onto the municipalities from all upper levels of government. And uh, it seems the North, sometimes our voice is not heard. Uh, when you say a rural municipality, 
surrounding Calgary or Edmonton, one of the big centers, versus a rural municipality in northern Alberta, they don't quite get the same uh, level of, of uh, you know, interest from the, the upper levels of government. I mean, our MLA, I, I will say he does advocate for us, but he's only one voice in the government, and sometimes it gets lost. So I, I just think that just because of where we are sometimes, we're kind of seen as an easy brush off. They can uh, funding can be you know more more targeted for the large areas, building a ring road or a transit system or a new hockey rink or whatever. Where the northern we have to kind of fight and claw for anything that we we do get on a much lower level. But uh, yeah, that's definitely agree with with uh, Reeve Willing. Karina, what about yourself? Would you agree with that statement? Before I jump into the next question about the downloading aspect, do you believe funding is the most pressing issue that's facing your community as well? Yes, yeah, definitely. And at the end of the day, there is only one taxpayer. So when we get the downloads from the federal or provincial, we are having to then ask the taxpayer to, to bring up that shortage, which is just wrong because then the provincial and federal are almost dub double dipping in a way because we're reduced funding yet we're being asked to to um, provide the same services with that less funding. I want to yeah. ask the pointed question. Sorry, Terry, to jump in, but I want to ask yeah. the pointed question. What downloading are you talking about? And I, this is a question that anyone can answer. Give me specifics of what downloading measures the federal and provincial government. And I see Bob sort of smirking there, but uh, what what specifically are you talking about? Because downloading is a big word, and I want to make sure I understand what you're talking about. Terry, were you jumping in on that, or is there something you no, want to follow no, up? I was just going to chime in on what Trina was saying. And I'll just be quick, is, is when the provincial government you know, says they're balancing their budget, but they're really balancing it on the backs of the municipalities, right? Is that just UCP or NDP as well? It, it, oh. it, all parties, right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but back to my original, my last question about what specific measures are being downloaded onto rural municipalities. Who wants to take that? Well, I'll start. I, you know, obviously, the, the biggest one that, that most people will understand is police funding. Um, up until about four years ago, uh, municipalities that were less than 5,000 in population uh, did not have to pay any funding for policing. So, um, I, I mean, we, we went from zero, our, our bill this year, I think, was $150,000. So, so that's a big, big ask. W whether it's right or not, I, I, I I actually kind of agree that maybe the smaller municipalities should be paying something for their policing. I, I get that. Um, but it's it's been a huge hit. Um, the other side is, you know, from the federal side is obviously the carbon tax. I mean, the carbon tax is hitting everybody really, really hard, uh, especially in rural municipalities. We have no options. I can't hop on a bus and go to work. Um, it's been suggested that we ride our bikes to go to work. Well, I mean, I live 15 kilometers out of town, which is actually very close, and there's no gravel. But I know lots of people who live 40 kilometers away, and half of it's gravel. So um, carbon tax on the federal side. Um, the other provincial uh, thing that a lot of municipalities are struggling with was uh, taxes in lieu of, of uh, Payments. So that's, um, we don't get taxes from government organizations that operate in our municipality. So they have taken a lot of that away from some of the municipalities. Uh, not us so much, but I know that the towns, which we support, they've been hit really hard because they don't get those, uh, those grants, those government grants for the, the government uh, facilities. Is this a trickle down effect that the issues that you're talking about, the downloading of the carbon tax, the downloading of the police funding just doesn't negatively affect your communities, it affects the communities that are within your counties and MDs as well. The ones that Absolutely. you have municipal agreements with. 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And what's what that does then is it forces those communities when they're coming and asking for funding from us to up their ask. They want they they're, they're struggling too, and we get it. We understand that they're struggling. Um, but our, our my municipality, on, like I said, on a five million dollar budget, we're paying over six hundred thousand dollars a year for recreation to other municipalities. That doesn't include our own recreation budget. And those are numbers that we have to pay. We have no options. So it's it's a struggle. And I would say the other part of that is our FCSS services. Yeah. We have lack of mental health. We have lack of food banks. And FCS services, according to the government, they fund 80%. Well, if you actually look at the full amount that municipalities are paying, we are over 65% because we're having to fill those gaps. The, the, the provincial government is no longer funding. And again, mental health is one of the biggest issues we have. And also our lack of transportation, as Bob had said, we are hit hard because we choose to live where we are. We choose to give the input of the GDP to the rest of the province, especially the large urban centers, but we get nothing back in a way. We're, we're hit doubly hard. And now the MSI funding or the new LGFF, we don't know what that's going to look like. And that could be another hit for us as well. Yeah, <clears throat> so, uh... I mean, Bob touched on the very obvious one, the police funding, which we never had before, and that's a good stage. So we started out at a, you know, I, I can't remember if it was 30% or whatever, but the number is growing, and it, it'll cap out here, but it's a huge line item on our budget now that we had no input into that was just handed to us. But there's a lot of smaller things that we're not mandated to, to support, but we do, as uh, we recognize, that the things that I think that should be the province's responsibility, things like mental health and women's shelters and food banks, uh, out of school programs, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, further like out of school education for people that are in need of, of a higher level of education. That, so those are all things that the government has kind of walked away from the provincial government. And so now the communities are kind of picked them up because they know they recognize the need for them. So of course, uh, we're part of the community too. So we, we fund those things. So, uh, you know, maybe five thousand dollars here, ten thousand dollars there doesn't seem much, but collectively they do add up. And and then I mean, the downloading started years ago. At, I mean, I grew up in the, our, our municipality, and and the roads and bridges were all maintained by the provincial government. They handed that all off to the municipality. So now now we're stuck with maintaining. A, and I think we're going to come to the age of infrastructure later, but uh, they handed off. You know, 2,000 kilometers of road and 200 bridges in our municipality that we're now responsible for. So that takes up the biggest part of our budget is our public works department. Uh, even supplying potable water to our residents. At one time, there was a federal program called PFRA that would help uh, fund water projects. And the province would also kick in. It used to be one third, one third, one third. Uh, so the municipality would, you know, say on a $10 million project, they would have to fund three million dollars of it. Well, now we fund it all 100. percent There's no no more funding available for one of the most essential things that we need is potable water, right? And we've and we've we brought to the top of our strategic plan more than once that uh, a good source of potable water is critical for development and re retention of residents. So now that's another example where we're funding that ourselves. So. I'm going to ask a very poignant question, and I do apologize. Um, there's been a lot of downloading that's been happening for rural municipalities like yours and the three of you together. Is this the nail in the coffin that is the slow decline of rural municipalities, do you think? Is this the way that the provincial and federal government is trying to amalgamate more rural areas into one larger area so that way there's less people asking for more money yeah <laughs> um, very pointed question very pointed answer i i believe that it's it's part of the strategy of the provincial government um uh, 
to to uh, reduce the number of municipalities. There are a lot. I, I get it. And and some of them are not viable and they struggle and they're asking for money all the time and the government is just tightening up their wallets and and uh, th that's happening. I mean, even with our municipality, uh, we have a village that's within our boundaries that is questionable whether or not they're viable. And I, I'm expecting within a year that they will dissolve. That's kind of where I see things going. I could be completely wrong. I, I hope I am. I, we love the village. We want them to stay viable. Um, but as as the surrounding municipality, we have no say in that either. We're just forced to take them. And uh, whether or not there's compensation, monetary compensation or not, is debatable. We don't even know if that's available. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that they're trying to reduce the best value. And I, I agree with, with both because we, since I've become a councillor, it's always it's been evident to me that they want Edmonton, Calgary, North and South. And that's what the province wants. And we are doing everything we can to stop that. But at the cost again, and I go back to my first uh, point, is there is only one taxpayer. Well, uh, used to be an organization called uh, AUMA, Alberta. Uh, the municipalities association they rebranded themselves to now become the alberta municipalities so it's almost an overreach like they're they're going to represent all municipalities rural and urban i mean they haven't come out and said that but why would they make that many change i'm not sure um so under several premiers ago i think it was premier stelmack the municipal affairs minister at that time said there shall not be I, i'll do everything to not have Rural municipalities dissolved. He, that was the last thing he wanted, and I clearly remember him saying that. But I mean, you can say whatever you want, but the reality is, when economics 101 kicks in, when you your income is uh, less than your expenses, then that's not a not a good outcome generally. I mean, it's I, I know some municipalities are probably one mega disaster away from bankruptcy rate. I mean, if they had a major infrastructure fail, a bridge washed out, or, uh, you know, it lost a, a major piece of infrastructure, they would not be able to recover from that. And uh, our municipality, it kind of came close to something like that happening. I mean, I wouldn't say we were close to being bankrupt, but it took a huge financial hit on us, and we are recovering from it. We will work our way out of it, but uh, a lot of municipalities don't have the capability of doing that. So as much as They've never come out and said that that was what their objective was. You can kind of read between the lines that they're definitely uh, in a, the direction you want to steer the municipalities to maybe amalgamate. And like Bob said, they have a village in their municipality. We have a town that's surrounded by our municipality that went through a viability review, and they kind of squeaked through it. The uh, they, they municipal affairs reviewed it, and the town took a vote on it. And said that uh, you know, they, would, they would be okay, they could continue on, but it, I think they just kicked the can further down the road, really. That, that when their streets start to crumble and their water system starts to fail, and uh, I mean, they're always looking to us for assistance, so we can only help so much. But uh, I mean, we don't want to see them dissolve because, like Bob said, we have no choice, we have to absorb them. That's just the way the NGA reads. So we'll, we don't have a, a money tree out the backyard that we can shake and. All of a sudden, fix all their problems. Their problems become our problems, then. So, and you I, talk I attended the the ABMUE conference, and some of the wording there was quite alarming. They had a, amalgamation on almost every paper. Uh, they had crit, critical mass, and they got a study um, future municipal government that is quite alarming. So. It did raise a lot of concerns attending that conference. So we are very aware that there is something in the background. And our concern is if it gets in the wrong government, that that's, that is going to happen. We want to rule Northern Alberta because I do not want a councillor in 
Edmonton or even Grand Prairie to be making decisions on what happens in my municipality, right? I mean, they, they are, would, would not be in touch. And we've seen centralization and other um, organizations that were thought to be a good model, but really the decision making made at a central body like that. And I mean, that's where uh, the, the, ple the victim services is headed, right? That's the next one that they're going to target through centralization, and, and that will not work out any better. So, as far as municipalities to be centralized, uh, I'll, on my watch, I'll, I'll fight that until the end if, it, uh, if that's the direction we're going. But. I want to jump in on the infrastructure topic here because you've mentioned it a few times. With all the downloading that you're seeing in your rural municipalities, whether it be police services, whether it be the carbon tax, whether it be FCSS, whether it be uh, mental health issues, you have to make up that funding somehow. You are right. There's only one taxpayer. This means infrastructure projects are being forgotten about or potentially aging out to potentially be worse off, and it's going to cost a lot more money. How do you see the issue of aging infrastructure and access to basic services affecting the quality of life in your communities? Terry, do you want to start with that? Because you were talking about aging infrastructure a few minutes yeah, ago. Yeah, well, I mean, so the province back in the 50s and 60s went on a campaign where they, they built uh, lots of rural roads and, and put bridges and kind of had a cookie cutter model that they built these things. They're all reaching. So, I mean, we've been kind of trying to be as proactive as we can as uh, of doing, you know, road upgrades and, and bridge upgrades as the engineers kind of dictate. They say that they're not safe to travel on. So we've been doing that, but it's going to reach a point, I think, where they're going to be a whole bunch of us at one time. And we definitely won't be able to uh, fund that all at once or even over a period of time. I mean, there is a provincial program. We can't eat up from the provincial government totally. They do have their STIP program, which is a program to fund bridge repairs. And, and we've been very fortunate. We've uh, been successful in a lot of those applications, but not all of them. I mean, that, that, pool, that pot of money is shared by all the province, all the real municipalities. So um, what we may get successful in one year, we may get nothing the next year. So when that time comes when these bridges start to fail, We've already had this discussion, but there may become a point where we may have to actually close the road and say, you know, it was convenient for an agriculture producer that he could travel five miles to get to that particular parcel of land. He may have to go around and take 10 mile road now because we just have to close that road. And that's probably the biggest infrastructure challenge we have is roads and bridges. I mean, we have uh, our water system is relatively new. I don't know what the lifespan of that will be. That probably be somebody else's watch and have to deal with that. I mean, we have an airport that we maintain for firefighting and for air ambulance service and private or private aircraft as well. Um, I mean, that's going to need an overlay at some point, but, and the price and everything has just escalated so much with inflation that uh, there's going to be challenges for that. I mean, we, we try to build reserves. Um, yeah, I, I mean, those are kind of our, our main infrastructures. Is, is uh, our public work stuff, our roads, bridges, water system, and the airport. Do you feel like that the, that if you don't address these issues in the next five, 10 years, they're going to get worse off? And if so, could that potentially harm the potential attraction and retention of residents to your community when you have broken down roads, broken down infrastructure, bridges that are in disrepair, how much does infrastructure play into attracting and retaining residents to your community? Well, I would say it's, it's a huge part because you're talking about public safety. At the end of the day, you're wanting um, your agriculture, your oil and gas, your forestry to arrive safely at our residents where, wherever they need to be. And in rural areas, we have thousands of kilometers of roads and bridges that we're having to maintain. Now, Northern Sunrise itself is a fairly young, shall we say, county, and our reserves are, are quite full. But there's others in the region that are not in that position. 
So you, you could have a bridge pile of $20 million that will take out most of our reserves in one hit. So it does, it does happen. And some of these bridge piles are going to cost that amount just to replace our water. We need to get a new water intake for our, our water operations. And that is into the billions that we're trying to deal with right now. Do you think it's fair that our rural municipalities are asking to be are being asked to do more with the same amount of funding that they're getting or potentially even less when it comes to infrastructure projects and maintaining the services that they were once uh, described as provincial services? I, I think that would be a fair assessment. I, you know, things cost more here too. And so, you know, $100,000 in Edmonton will go a lot further than $100,000 up here. Uh, it costs way more money to get the people up. Some of the, some of the equipment doesn't even exist in, in Northern Alberta specialty. When they built the, the bridge over Peace River here over the last few years, uh, you know, massive amounts of equipment were needed. Well, you have to transport that and bring up the operators and, and all of that were in the bigger communities. Uh, the funding certainly would be less, right? Or, or the, the impact on the funding would be less because all of that exists there. So I think it is a, a fair assessment that it costs more. It's, I mean, it's just a, it's a geographic thing, right? The it's, devil's it's advocate, the devil's advocate in me wants to say, but it's your issue. It's your county. It's your rural municipality. Why should other municipalities have to pick up the bear? And I'm not trying to be rude here at all. No, Please no. excuse. I, I'm assuming you've heard this from provincial legislatures and provincial representatives and also from urban representatives. Yeah. What do you say to people when they say, it's your issue. It's your bridge. You're the ones that are well, driving over this. We're like someone down in Calgary isn't using that bridge. So why should we have to pay for it? Well, I, I could be facetious and say, well, then it's our oil. It's our grain. It's our canola, timber. Uh, you name it. That's what we have. I mean, we provide those resources to the rest of the province. It's got to be a shared responsibility on on the delivery of those uh, resources. Um, if it's if it's onerous on the people creating them all the time, they'll stop, right? I mean, if they can't make money up here, the oil companies will pull out and then where are people, where are people going? So, I, I mean, I mean, if we're a province, we're a province. And we're not, you know, we're, we're not a sub part of the province and, and we shouldn't be treated as such, right? Do you but feel that way? Go back to uh, use that, that thinking for healthcare. Um, I, I mean, the, the province said all Albertans shall be have equal access to healthcare. Well, I think all Albertans should have access to all departments, right? Not just don't say well healthcare education. I mean, we, we should be treated fairly because, as Bob said, the GDP that comes out of our region is huge, and uh, we, that should be reflected back on, on, on our infrastructure. To help, I, I get it. But we are now the owners of this infrastructure, and it's up to us to manage it. And we do. I mean, we are managing it. It's a huge cost, but it's going to come a day of reckoning when uh, it might be more than we can handle. One thing that I've noticed in our municipality, and again, like I say, I uh, grew up here. Infrastructure from the 1950s and 60s, uh, you'd get a little 80 horsepower tractor driving down the road, holding a 16 foot elevator and a 510 grain truck, maybe. Now we're seeing massive uh, infra, uh, resources going on our roads, like huge retrain truck and trailers, uh, big air drills, big combines, grain carts, uh, infrastructure is oh, logging trucks. Yeah, you know, logging trucks, oil tankers. Infrastructure was never designed to handle that kind of weight. I mean, again, yeah, we can put road bands on them and keep them off there, but we have to work with industry and especially agriculture. I mean, they, they seem to get a Kind of a free pass because they 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 founded our municipalities, right? So we don't want to come down hard to them. Yeah. And, and, and agriculture is pretty important. I mean, you yeah. got to you got to eat. It. If, you know, worst comes to worst, that's that's what we're providing. So, and and Terry's right. The infrastructure was designed 
for half the capacity that it's carrying now. So that's one of the worries that we have is as we're upgrading bridges, we're having to upgrade them to huge capacities compared to what they were. The last bridge we built was $2 million. It went over a tiny little creek that's basically dry in the summertime. But it needed to be that big because of the location and and uh, and the uh, environmental concerns around it. So, and really, in the north, we only have our option of transportation to get around from our landmass. When you looked at the landmass we have, that's outside of Edmonton and Calgary. It's huge, and but that's where your GDP comes from as well. So it is. It should be looked upon that a ring road around Calgary is just as important as a bridge file in northern Alberta or southern Alberta. Do you think that the policies that the federal and provincial governments implement should be more based on regional approaches compared to more provincial or federal approaches? Because the like you said, that $2 million bridge had to be built to provincial regulations, I'm assuming. But that bridge is probably built to the exact same standard that is happening in Calgary, but you have a lot more traffic that is heavier on that bridge. So you could have done it in a different way and potentially saved some money. Do you think the regional approaches should be looked at more than the provincial approaches? Well, can I jump in? Yep. I, this is not going to be about infrastructure, but it's going to be about federal and provincial policies. And so there is there's a federal policy that's called the species at risk policy that has been passed on to the provinces to kind of roll out. That is probably going to be the single biggest impact on our municipality is a species at risk because we happen to be blessed with a a caribou herd in our municipality where most of our industrial activity takes place, forestry and oil and gas and recreation like uh, outfitting. So this legislation or policy that comes from the top level of government, the federal government, the environment, climate, environment, climate change, climate control, whatever they call them, E Triple C, they have they have come up with this. So it's a bureaucratic decision made in the Chambers of Ottawa that has been mandated to the provinces to to administrate, and the municipality really doesn't have much input into it. It's kind of a handed to us. Here, thou shalt do this. You shall uh, protect these caribou at the cost of industry. So, so absolutely, what kind of a roundabout way to answer your question? Federal provincial policy can have a huge impact, maybe positively in some cases, but definitely can have negative impacts on municipalities. So how do you survive? Sorry, sorry. How do you survive when the policies that federal and provincial governments implement could negatively impact your communities and could have financial uh, infrastructure uh, detriments to your communities? How do you survive when we talk about the policies that they implement? Sometimes they're not good for your community, but you have to implement them. Yeah, How do so, you survive in that way? So worst case scenario, um, I mean, we would survive. We would, we would go back 50 years. We'd become a small agriculture community again that doesn't have, I mean, the municipality would look way different because our biggest assessments we have our industrial assessments, right? So if they pull out of town, which they would if they don't have the fiber supply or the access to the minerals, they would hold up and leave, right? And that would, I mean, when, you're, when your budget would be cut probably by three quarters, well, then all of a sudden you don't provide the services that we do now. But what we're doing to, to for survival mode is we're pushing back, right? So there's a group of northern municipalities, we formed an organization called the Northwest Species at Risk uh, Committee. And we're all kind of like-minded, all Northwestern Alberta municipalities. Uh, I think that these two have joined as associate members. And uh, so it did prove one thing that uh, strength of numbers, when we got a group of municipalities together and we made trips to Ottawa, we made trips to Edmonton, we stood on the steps of the legislature and protested 
And uh, they didn't kind of back off. They kind of pushed the pause button because the government of the day, I won't say who it was, but they were determined that they were going to create huge conservation areas in northwest Alberta. They were going to draw a line in the map, and these were no-go zones for development and industry. I mean, they were going to have some exit strategies for them. They weren't going to just kick them out the next day. But uh, they kind of pushed the pause button on that and uh, kind of came up with what they call a Section 11 agreement where the province has X amount of years to kind of come up with a, a plan how they're going to how they're going to help this recovery process. So, so I think that the municipal voice was very powerful, still is. We still we still meet with uh, you know the elected people at the higher levels of government to uh, get our message out that our social economic structure of our municipalities does matter. That we're not just uh, you know a few people living in some igloos up there that it won't really matter that we but that we do actually have schools, we have hospitals, we have you know, all the protection services, we have a retail industry, that we have we have a life up here. This is our home, right? That uh, that there has to be a balance and that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for to get rid of this caribou recovery plan. We want to have a balance plan. And uh, that's so we actually just in our municipality we just came out of a that Chimchaga sub regional task force planning we call it, where we're we're doing land planning. So it's in the draft process now. So I'm kind of waiting to see how that comes out. I, I think what people need to realize is that these these federal policies and provincial policies that affect us up here in our day to day operations, there's a huge trickle down, you know, because of the GDP and because of the resource extraction that comes out of our areas. If it's affecting us, it's affecting everybody. Eventually, it's you know, you, you can take a look at. Uh, um, the Liberal government's uh, mandate to go to electric cars by such and such a date. Well, you can't even drive to Edmonton right now on an electric car because there's no charging stations on the way and you can't get there on a full charge. So, I mean, the logistics behind it and, and the decisions are made based on a population model where everybody lives in close proximity to one another, not five hours of driving at 110 kilometers an hour north right and you know we're we're six hours south of the northern border of alberta as well so i mean uh, i mean people say that we're northern alberta we're not even really northern alberta we're north central i guess probably closer so people just don't understand they just don't realize the the geography and the constraints so those those policies are going to affect everybody and I, there's definitely one part of miseducation is that we are the envy of the world for our oil and gas and our cleanliness of our oil and gas and our, our forestry. Our, the, um, the forestry does very well here and replanting and looking after the forest because if you don't look after the forest, the forest will look after itself and that will be a detriment. So there's that misunderstanding and the federal government comes down on us of things we're doing well, but they tend to penalize us because we're doing well and they want us to make us look bad when we're not. Yeah, so, so decisions made by people that are really not in touch with uh, the landscape up here, right? And those policies made by somebody doing their job. They're, that's who's, you know, they're getting their paycheck signed by so they told them to do that, so that's what they do. But they're really not in, in tune with what the reality is. Like, I'll go back to the caribou, uh, the caribou habitat, supposedly, and, and the caribou range in our municipality is 90 or 95% disturbed. So if you're an urban person living in uh, Vancouver or Toronto or even Calgary, Edmonton, and, it, and somebody tells you, oh, that, that caribou habitat up there is 95% disturbed, well, you get this instant vision of a moonscape, right? Where Things are just, you know, disaster. There's uh, roads everywhere and plowed up river streams. And the reality is, it's not. I mean, I've worked in that area all my life and I've flown over it many times. And you'd be hard pressed to say that's 5% disturbed, right? You'll see a little bit of linear disturbance, maybe a pipeline right away or a road, maybe a lot, a cut block. Uh, Mother Nature does a lot more destruction by wildfires and uh, pine beetle destruction. Forestry is uh, 
very good stewards of wildlife, like Primo said. I mean, they really treat and harvest, they, they reforest tree. And uh, to me, boreal forest, the trees are like any crop. When they're time to harvest, you harvest them. Otherwise, you wouldn't leave your wheat crop stand out in the field and say, oh, I'm going to leave it, it's, even though it's ready to harvest, because you would end up with nothing, right? So trees are no different. They, they have a lifespan. And you take you, you offer, take your opportunity when they're optimum to harvest. And so yeah, I mean, these these policies really bother me sometimes how they're how they're driven out of the at the doors of the upper bureaucrats and the higher levels of government. I'm going to ask a very weird question right now, and I do apologize for it. But when was the last time a government minister from the federal government met with any one of you? Never. I would say never. Never. I mean, beyond our local MP. Yeah, be, uh, beyond your local MP, which is, I'm assuming, Chris Walkerton or Arnold Vierson for both of you, for all three yeah. of you. When was the last time a federal minister, and that's going back even to the Harper years, when was the last time a federal minister, do you recall, meeting with your local area? Never. 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 No. Why well, have only been on council in six years but hearing the history i'm not aware it's ever happened we, we can't even get provincial politicians to come and visit us yeah so you're, you're jumping into my question here bob but when was the last time a federal <laughs> minister under this premier so under premier smith when was the have you a, have you met with Premier Smith? Have you met with Rachel Notley? Because we're about to go into an election. They're crisscrossing this province. Have you met with anyone from the provincial government or opposition to address these concerns? Uh, not, not up here. I mean, we do huh. meet with uh, provincial ministers when we go to Edmonton for conferences or other meetings. But, you no, know, I... So they're from willing to, they want you to come to them, but they don't want you to come to you. Okay. Well, I, I don't know what their reasons are. For my municipality, uh, I, I've never met with the premier. I've only met with a couple ministers. Minister of Municipal Affairs, especially, has been very good. Minister of Health has been good. Um, I, I haven't even seen my MLA in four years. He, he doesn't seem to be around very much. No, that's the yeah. So, who's your MP? Who, who's your MLA? Sorry, Dan Williams. Okay. Um, and well, sorry, Dan Williams and Todd Rowan were kind of split our, our municipality. So I, we, we don't even really see them very often. You know, sometimes they'll make an effort. I mean, we have to request for them to come and see us. They never. It's never on their fault. So. Well, Do you feel like you're begging sometimes? Do you feel well, like you're begging yeah. at the trough of the provincial government and federal government for even to be heard? Well, I, I, don't, I don't I don't want to jeopardize any of my funding. So, I, no, I, I, I apologize. Sometimes, sometimes but, that way, right? well, so maybe, maybe I got a bit of a more positive story because, um, again, they don't make a regular trip up to our municipality either. Our local MLA, I've got a good relationship with them. I see them more frequently maybe than Bob has, but uh, for whatever reasons. And, but we, uh, our municipality got into a, we got a, a huge arbitration award against us on a water project we did. And it uh, put us in a crisis mode there. This happened just before Christmas and we kind of just rested on it till after New Year's because of the Christmas season. And so we, I, I was met with the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister of uh, transportation and not directly with the Minister of Finance, but had very positive outcomes from them. They were more than willing to recognize what went on and uh, and I have to I have to publicly thank them for their help that they gave us to help bail us out of the situation. Not totally, we're still we're treading water at least now we're not underneath anymore. So um, and then and I, at our last provincial conference we had for rural municipalities I took the time to make sure I went and thanked each of those ministers personally. And I actually spoke with the premier quickly. She was a very busy woman. And but uh, she's gonna walk and talk, she said. Hey, so we chatted as we walked together down the hallway and just got out a couple of concerns I had with her and you know, passed her on the information on whether it ever 
went any further than that on every one, I guess. But uh, so they are they are approachable, and maybe that's uh, partially because there's an election coming up. But uh, uh, I, I I've met the premier before when she was uh, opposition, and I met her when she was a radio host. And uh, so yeah, I, I I have I have spoke with her a few times, but uh, again, living in the north. We don't seem to get the attention of uh, probably some of the southern constituencies do. And for our uh, municipality, Todd Lowy is coming up the end of next or this month, so we will see him. And then uh, we, like Bob has said, when we go to the RMA, we do get to have those conversations yeah. then. Uh, it's usually by appointment only, or we have the bear pit session where we can ask questions at the RMA. Um, I can't say that I know Jason Hoppings has come up here, the health minister. Um, we we saw Dan Williams. I saw him at the Carnival in February. So um, we do see a little bit of them, but I would say a lot of the ministers we don't see very often. And, and to be fair, too, I, I mean I, I don't want to come across like like we're we really need to meet with them because we don't necessarily. I mean. We have some issues. Funding is, is is one of the bigger ones, and and I know that they're busy. They have other problems, you know, a lot more problems than we do. And you know, I'm I'm one of these type that like try to solve our problems ourselves. Sometimes it would be nice just to, to sit and visit with them on a social basis because you can you really can make a connection with somebody and get a lot more done when you know them. But they're busy too, you know. Like there's you know. Definitely. And understandable, but you need an advocate, do you not? And I, I don't want to just pick on the UCP here because there's another party that did represent parts of your areas, the NDP. Yeah. Debbie Jabor and Mark McQuaid Boyd were both NDP MLAs for four years. Did you have the same relationship with them where if you needed them, they would come or you would have to go to them? Or is this just a UCP problem? Because I just want to know with the election coming up, are I who who do you see as the better advocate for your area? Or is it just you? Is it I, you just have to serpent the local MLAs and just hope to God your ministers will listen to you? <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's one party over the other. I, 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 I would certainly hope not. I, <laughs> I think that if we had a real problem and needed to have some help, um, that we, we would be able to talk to whoever it is. I, um, it's, uh, you know, when Debbie and, and, and uh, Mark were both, were both there, they would come occasionally if we requested them to, um, we've talked to them about issues and, and Todd has been really good. We've gone to visit Todd in his office in Fairview and, and so it's, it's, and we do have an advocate. I mean, we do have our provincial organization, you know, the rural municipalities of Alberta, and they've been very good. They've provided us tons of resources. And if we do have problems, we just have to make a call to them. And they'll, they, they'll, they have moved mountains in the past to make sure that we get the resources that we need to look at problems. So, yeah, so Chris, just to echo that, I, I don't see any difference in the relationship from one party to the other. Um, it, I mean, like, like we all said, that they're busy people. They got, uh, Bigger fires to put out sometimes, and what we might conceive may conceive as a, a big problem in our municipality. That, so they, but they, they've always been responsive. I, I will say that. And our MLA down when it was a, uh, a he's, he's been an advocate. He advocates for us, and uh, I mean he's a kind of a backbencher. So I guess I don't know where his his message ends up at the end of the day, but. Uh, I, I don't see a problem with relationship with the with the ministry or with our local MLAs. They they, they recognize us, and, and I I would say most of our communication is likely through emails, where we'll send a letter, and we do yeah. we we do get a response. It's just where it's harder to have that in person conversation because without an airport as well that hurts us as well so they can no longer fly in and cut that day down it's a five six hour drive depending where they're going so that does cut into it so that that does hurt us 
But you know, again, numbers speak, right? We, in 2019 and 2020, we had uh, historic grain zones at Boundary 18 Center, but I happened to live there, and we could not get out our fields to make hay to get crops off. I mean, they did eventually, but at great cost, and it was it was horrible, right? And so I went out and met with the agriculture minister today, and there is a fund, uh, Ag Recovery, it's called, it's kind of part of a AFSC yeah, uh, program that they can roll out. And when it needs the provincial government to trigger this thing for a payout, and I, and I, we met all the criteria that we would call it kind of a regional disaster there. And they looked at it and showed them pictures and documents, and they all kind of nodded their heads, but nothing happened. Well, the next year, or maybe the year after 2022, there was a severe drought in the southern part of the province, huge area. Well, guess what? The ag recovery program kicked in then. So numbers matter, right? If, uh, if, if a whole bunch of municipalities kind of declare that and see that disaster, then it, it then it uh, comes into effect. But when one small rural northern area uh, just kind of you know that you don't qualify for that. So and not pointing fingers or blaming anybody. That's just kind of the way I, I guess a democratic society works, right? But, and I, I would say our our strength in numbers is to add advocate when. When there is a concern that affects all of us, we will all get together and we will make a strong stance. And I, I think that's where we work very well together. I want to turn to one, the last subject before we wrap up here. And I want to talk about healthcare. Healthcare is an important issue for a lot of communities right now. We are seeing doctor shortages. We are seeing uh, uh, medical practitioners leaving uh, communities and going to large urban centers, which is a detriment to communities like yours. These people will have to drive to Grand Prairie, Peace River, even to Edmonton to get medical uh, uh, services. So as the Reeves of three rural municipalities in Northern Alberta, how are you addressing the issue of health care and mental health services in your rural communities? Who wants to take oh, that first? Can I take Yeah, so our um, Sunrise Medical Center, which was built with the collaboration of our regional municipalities, has 14 doctors. So we, Northern Sunrise, is the manager of that. However, the input of the cost to build the structure was a regional approach. And that's been one of the successes in our area for doctors. And we hear the doctors are very happy to be here and not they're not under AHS. So they do tend to stay a lot happier here. However, we do have 11 acute beds out of 31 that's been closed since last June, which they keep telling us is lack of nurses. Now we're we're not we're questioning why that is continuing when we hear there's nurses looking for physicians so we're not sure what's happening there there must be there's a bigger picture that we're not aware of of course mental health is a really difficult area for us to bring people in and the province does not fund that for us so that is one of our biggest gaps in our system especially for our youth as well and when we look at the town of peace river right now they're i would say they're in a crisis mode because they got correctional staff um that are releasing inmates when they don't have a selected date for their release they're released but they have to be released to a point where there's points of care and that place right now is the town of Peace River with the shelter. So in December, there were 76 released. 15 of those, from what I understand, have stayed in Peace River. Now that is an issue where we're seeing it in our, in our surrounding municipalities now is these homeless people are now moving to different areas and of course causing different parts of crime. That is addressing now the addictions. So we've got RCMP that are responding to the same person eight times a day because of their, their mental health crisis. And we don't have the assistance here. We have nowhere 
where we can hold somebody. So they either have to go to Grand Prairie or Edmonton, and that's a 10 or 12 hour journey for an RCMP officer to move that person. So we have huge gaps up here and we can't, it's unfortunate we can't get the funders to pick up on the ideas that we're putting forward. There's some really strong ideas that's coming out of our mental health task force that's in the region, but the province isn't listening to them. Yeah, it's, you know, we, we're quite fortunate with the doctor situation up here. There's been lots of recruitment uh, going on, uh, especially with South Africa. And, um, you know, within our municipality, I mean, we touch the town of Peace River. So, so um, we have access to those doctors and the town of Grimshaw has their own doctors as well. So that's been good. The, the lack of nurses and, and the, the shutting down of the uh, acute care beds and, and parts of the hospital on a rotating basis. Basically, it's been continuous since October mm -hmm. uh, or June last mm -hmm. year. Actually, yeah, it was June last summer. So that's been a concern because it's been almost a year and not much has changed. I understand that there's issues there. They, it's hard for them to get nurses or maybe the right nurses. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, EMTs and uh, you know emergency uh, uh, you know ambulance services. I know that that's a struggle. Uh, hard to get people to, to move up here. Um, do you see it yourself as rural municipalities of giving incentives to local medical professionals, whether it be EMT operators, whether it be doctors to say, hey, if you come up here, we'll help you out X, Y, and Z, or come explore this great area that we have. What incentives do you drive people to bring them up to your communities right now? If any? We, we do that already. We, we pay for housing for, for doctors, uh, maybe not permanent, but but certainly for short term to, to, to get them accustomed to the community. Um, we're actually working with a, a couple right now. Um, it's actually the opposite. They're hiring, we're hiring uh, one of the organizations that, that we have a, a stake in is hiring a, a, a community planner and her husband is a doctor. So for us, that's a bonus. We, we're actually getting, a, we're getting two things that we really need out of one couple. So we, we we're actively looking at that, looking at uh, employment for the spouses, um, whatever we can do. There's there's um, we provide a lot. So yeah. So, so we have here in rural northern Alberta, and I want to say rural remote northern Alberta because a lot of times when AHS or Alberta Health refers to rural Alberta, they sometimes lump uh, Devon or Airdrie in that conversation. So uh, rural Alberta and Peace server Manning, Grimshaw is a lot different, right? So we, again, being a lifetime resident up here, um, but one time you could go to the, I'll use the Manning Hospital, that's the center of our municipality. You could have, uh, your children can be born there. You could have minor surgeries there. You could have pretty much a full suite of services other than you know, the major things like a brain surgery or a heart transplant or something, but you never expected that to start with. Those things have all vanished now, right? So we're, we've become more a glorified first aid station. I, that's been a little harsh. I mean, we, we still have an emergency department. We have a long-term care facility. We have acute beds, which are closed like otherwise, partially closed because of lack of staff. Um, our municipality, we fund and participate in three uh, attraction and retention committees, one in the town of Peace River, one in the town of Grimshaw, and one in the town of Manning. So, so those those committees um, are kind of committed or dedicated to help find strategies to attract healthcare workers of, of all stripes, not just doctors, but nurses, um, mental health workers, physiotherapy workers, and all those types of services that we're lacking up here. And then the big part is to retain them, right? We can get them here, but we want to make show them that rural life is 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 not maybe what they imagined it to be, right? We don't have a Walmart in Manning. We don't have a Costco. We don't have an indoor pool. We don't have a lot of amenities at the bigger centers that even Peace River can offer. But we have people, right? And the people are very embracing and very welcoming. And we found that that has worked. That they've kind of found their 
for the people to go to them and, and, and they, they stay, you know, I mean, they, nobody ever stays forever. That's one thing I've learned with physicians and nurses, that if you're, if you're not a local and you weren't from that community, chances are eventually you're going to move on as your, as your family grows and you need higher levels of education or your desires change. But, I mean, if we can get 10 or 20 years out of them, that's a success for us, right? And, uh, but the big, I think the big problem of healthcare, and not just the rural areas, probably province wide, is EHS has become a juggernaut organization. They've, they've created a kind of a, a dynasty there, and they're kind of eroding from the inside out. Like when we see, and I, and I know this as a, from a fact, because I have a very good relationship with some of the medical staff, is that uh, there's a nursing shortage. So what they're using to fill that shortage is what they call um, agency nurses or local nurses. So these are kind of nurses for hire, and they can come from anywhere. They can come from Newfoundland, they can come from Milford River, they can come from Edmonton, and come up and fill in those positions that, on a temporary basis at probably three times the cost of a, of a full-time employee. And so they figured that system out that they get, they get housing, they get uh, you know travel allowances, and they get a ridiculous wage. And, and no fault of theirs, you know, it's there for them to take advantage of. And uh, so so we have situations where there might be a graduate nurse comes to work in a rural hospital who really has not much experience behind her other than her four year of training and her, her little bit of assessment she went through and work alongside an experienced local full-time nurse who tells her how to do her job because she's not familiar with it. She's getting third of the wage that those agency nurses but it kind of breaks the morale of, the, of anybody wanting to, you know, engage in a full-time position. So I, I think the whole thing has got to be, the whole model of how we deliver these services has to be re-looked at. And uh, I say as, as AHS grew over the years, they become more management heavy and, and less practical solutions were involved. And so I've always advocated that we should go back to regional health boards. I mean, there's still a place for a central health board. You know, for curing certain things, maybe, or but there's definitely, I think, room for going back to regional model. It goes back to what I said, what we said before about some uh, council in Edmonton or Grand Prairie making decisions for us in our municipalities. It just, it's not a one size fits all model at times. So, and we are, our PAC, which is a very strong group, as Terry had said. If there is a new doctor that comes up here, uh, the group will take the time to tour them around, um, introduce them to the area, introduce them to the hospital, whichever one they're they're going to. Um, we've even taken them on the on the riverboat and just really show them the area and, and embrace the the residents, embrace what they're they're coming to and it really does help and it, it is a, a very strong point that we have here and it's a real strong group that we have i'm going to ask uh, a the, a second last question that i was not planning on asking but i think you guys are all prepared for it we are in election season we are about to see a writ dropped on may 1st by the time this uh, people start watching this we are still in an unofficial election you, as the leaders of your communities, will be watching this election very closely. But everyone is saying rural doesn't matter. Every This election is going to be won and fought in Calgary. That means your voices will not be heard in some sense. If you listen to the pundits on media, if you listen to the pollsters, rural doesn't matter. How do you push back against that narrative? How do you push back against that narrative? And what are you hoping to hear from the party leaders in this election that ensures that your voices, your communities are not forgotten? Well, I think that uh, it's an education process, right? That uh, the big urbans, like you say, and I've heard the same thing, that this election will be probably won or lost in Calgary. Um, I mean, Edmonton, we pretty much know which direction they're going to go again. Uh, the rurals, yeah, I mean, we do matter a certain amount. I mean, if we all went orange, that might push the vote one way or the other. But uh, I, I think that the, the, the urbans have to understand the value of, of uh, the policies put forward by the, or whichever party of, of, of presents 
all those things that are going to be most beneficial to everybody. And I mean, keeping a healthy industry alive is is beneficial to everybody. I mean, Port McMurray drove the nation, right? It drove the province for sure. It, it was the economic engine. And they only have one constituency up there, right? one seat. Um, so does it matter to the people in Calgary if they, whichever is that, doesn't matter which way which lands goes, if they, if they vote conservative or if they vote NDP? Well, it does matter because the policies that keep that alive, and it's the same in our area for forestry, if, uh, if, if, if some environmental agenda comes up policy that says we're going to shut down huge tracts of the forest in the, of our municipality, well, it, it, it may, you may think it doesn't affect you living in, in somebody's basement in Calgary, but it does because everybody says, oh, it's good, this is going to be free, this is going to be free. Nothing is free in this world. Somebody's paying for that somewhere, right? They're just taking it out of somebody else's pocket. So I, I think that we need that education to understand that what happens in rural Alberta affects everybody. And I don't know how we get that message across. I'm sure that the people who are campaigning realize that and they're trying to get that message out there. But will they be successful? I guess we'll know by the end of the day. And, and, and people that are saying that, I mean, that's statistics. I mean, you, I mean you're looking at the statistical model as to how how elections are, are won and lost. And, you know, I mean, I understand that, but at the same time, a vote is a vote and everybody has the same vote. Uh, you know, they've said that rural is going to go to UCP. Well, I'm not quite so convinced that it's always going to be that way. I mean, yes, we are conservative for the most part, but um, not everything that the UCP does is, is uh, cut and dry. And, uh, you know, we're not happy with everything that the government is doing, and, and they have to realize that. And you know, don't forget, don't forget the rurals. The rurals are part of the province, plain and simple. And that that brings up a really good point: is because we are only five percent of the the population, but eighty percent of the landmass, and Alberta is the only province that has municipalities border to border. So that rural divide and that urban divide, it is there and it is very strong. And unfortunately, it's, it's getting stronger. When we go to Edmonton or Calgary, when you speak to the Edmontonians or Calgarians, you can, you can understand that divide because you ask any of them, have you been to Northern Alberta? Their answer 80% of the time is no. So their rural to them is 30 minutes outside of Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And that's the education piece we need to change. And I can consistently hear Red Deer is rural. And Edmonton is northern Alberta. That's the education piece that we need to change. And that is something I'm hoping that whoever the local next government will be, will understand that message and understand that when we come to the mic and we're talking about our causes, it's because we care or because we have to work so much harder to get that one message out than anybody does in urbans because they they likely meet the minister for coffee once in a while. For us, we have to make that appointment. We have to travel that five hours. We need to make that time where we might get 15, 20 minutes of their time. So that is the education piece that needs to change and we will keep advocate, advocating and you will know when the rural municipalities are not happy with a decision because we will all get together and we will make our presence known. We've already done it. We've turned our backs to the legislator when they wanted to go after our assessment and when we do get together, our message, like I said, is extremely strong. It certainly is. But I will say, as a former rural Albertan who lived in Faust, Alberta, I know rural Alberta. So I know I live in Calgary now, but I, I, I know the trials and tribulations of rural Alberta. And I wouldn't even say I was northern because I was probably about 10 minutes away from the geographical center of the province in Woodlands County. But I want to end with this question, and I want all three of you to answer this, and we'll go in reverse order from the way we started. So this will be starting with Karina. So in your opinion, what is some of the most effective ways to build stronger 
and more resilient rural communities in Northern Alberta. Karina? Our first one, I would say, is broadband, our lack of broadband. Without that, we can't build our industries. We can't build our residents, because that's one of the high questions that they ask, is what's your internet like? Because we know our industries cannot grow without that. Also, our rail, we need to have access to rail. We need to have access to grow our goods. Because again, if industry cannot expand because they cannot move their product, that hurts us and that hurts our GDP and it hurts our way to get economic development or even to get more people to come live in rural areas. I think those are our top issues and we need to sort out, again, our mental health and our health care. Harry, what about yourself? Uh, industry, we need industry, right, to, to have a strong tax assessment base. And industry wants predictability, right? They don't want to, they're not going to invest huge capital dollars in some place where there's no predictability. So we need to advocate, have that strong voice. And I'll go back to the, the Species at Risk Act, which is causing a lot of um, insecurity right now uh, with oil, gas, gravel, forestry, even agriculture is feeling the effects of that. Um, so, so we need to advocate for, for strong policies that can give predictability industry. And water is, uh, there's, a, there's a book written, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, it was by a, a former minister, you may know him, Doug Griffin. I'm actually speaking to him for an episode that's airing after this episode, Doug Griffiths. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And number one way to kill your community is not have a, a, a good water source, right? So we, we keep pushing that forward to that a great cost to us. And uh, yeah, and I guess what one thing that everybody compares us to everybody else, right? They're comparing us to our neighboring municipalities, to urban municipalities. How come our taxes are so much? Uh, well, they're not really. I mean, we're kind of right in the middle of the pack, maybe even lower in a lot of cases. But that's always always seems to come up in a conversation as, as uh, and especially this time of year, our tax notices are coming out, right? The phone usually rings quite a bit. So we, we've got to be mindful of that. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a landowner and I'm a taxpayer as well. So I'm no different than the next guy. I don't want to be paying any more taxes than what my fair share is. So uh, under my watch, I, uh, I, 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 I want to keep that in line and not let it get out of control. And uh, yeah, so, that, so the biggest, I, I think some of the biggest challenges I see in, in keeping our municipality healthy and, and growing forward is, is, is predictable policies by all levels of government, right from municipal through provincial to federal, that uh, will, will create an environment where we can continue to do business. Bob, what about yourself? Um, for, for, for me and for our municipality, it, it's, it, it's uh, I mean, I agree with what both both Karina and Terry have said. I mean, those are, those are all wonderful ideas. We need as communities to build stronger relationships with ourselves. So when, when you stand alone in, in, as a small rural North Alberta community, if you're by yourself, you've got nothing. Like, I mean, you've got nobody to advocate for you. If you have problems, you've got nobody to help you. It's it's it, it it it's bad. I mean, I think it's just really bad for us as communities. We need to really work on our relationships with our neighbors and make sure that we're not fighting amongst ourselves. I mean, we have enough problems fighting with the province and the feds and and everybody else that's that's looking for for what we have, that we need to be working together more as a group. We're stronger together as a group and we should be able to get more as a group. And I think that's what we need to do as municipalities. I wanna thank you, all three of you for sitting down and doing this today. This has been a very informative conversation and 
the issues that you've brought up, whether it be downloading from the provincial government, whether it be the carbon tax, whether it be RCMP, whether it be mental health and addiction, whether it be crime, whether it be broadband, these are important issues that need to be addressed in this election. And hopefully, 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 someone from the UCP and NDP will start talking about these issues because they are important. And we have to remember there are people outside of the pro of the city of Calgary and Edmonton and rural matters. I want to thank our guests for sharing their insights and experience with us when it comes to living and dealing with issues in rural Alberta. It is clear that there are many unique challenges facing rural communities, whether it be healthcare, the economy, finances, downloading of issues. And it's important that we continue to shed light on some of these issues. Hopefully, this upcoming provincial election, there will be some light shone on some of these issues that we discussed in today's episode. We hope that this episode has provided you with some valuable information and perspectives on the challenges facing rural municipalities in Alberta. As always, we encourage our viewers to stay informed, stay engaged on these issues. We also hope, if you can, take a moment and hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. It would be greatly appreciated. And we want to also thank you for tuning in. We will be back next Friday with another episode, but this time we'll be talking to former ministers of municipal affairs. So with that, this has been the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. As always, just keep talking.